So uh, thank you to Terry and Eric for organizing this and for inviting me. Um, I was a late addition to the uh, to the speaker list, and I'm hopeful that I can uh, contribute. Uh, I spent some time last night reorganizing, as I heard in more detail, uh, what it is we're going for here. So. Um, I'll tell you that uh, the way I've thought about this is um, in thinking about uh, genomic variants to guide treatment, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, what's been done, uh, a little bit about what we're doing, and then um, an idea of how I would think about this in terms of uh, large cohorts. So these are my uh, financial disclosures, none of which uh, influence my talk today. So uh, with the title of, of using uh, genomic variants to guide treatment, I think if you look uh, at um, the highlight list of what's out there uh, over the last decade or so, certainly, uh, as was mentioned last night, um, PCSK9 uh, story uh, is, uh, is one of the, uh, the biggest uh, on my list of uh, important um, variants guiding treatment. I guess thinking of other uh, highlights on my list, uh, I think the APOL1 story, uh, which has been associated with, uh, as many of you know, with uh, risk for um, end-stage renal disease in African Americans, um, and uh, is showing itself to be an autosomal recessive risk uh, in what, um, as a major driver in a complex disease. Um, Getting into a uh, relatively rare uh, disease, uh, the story uh, that uh, has been put forth by Hal Dietz um, most prominently and others of uh, changing um, our thinking about Marfan syndrome from a structural, purely structural disease to a uh, uh, chronic inflammatory disease uh, through what they found with fibrillin uh, and then with the TGF beta receptor genes. Um, and then certainly uh, the stories out of pharmacogenomics, uh, which many of you are involved in and know much more than me, uh, are all some of the highlights. I'm sure other people uh, could add uh, enormously to this list, uh, but those would be some of the things I'd be thinking about as uh, variants guiding treatment and the highlights uh, of the recent decade. So. Uh, Terry sent this uh, email to me, and I'm sure to uh, many, saying that, um, you know, what we're really trying to accomplish here is to uh, think about uh, sequencing and complex disease to uh, reduce, reduce disease and help patients. Uh, and the key questions, as you know. Um, I spend uh, most of my time involved in clinical uh, genotype phenotype correlation. So I'm a clinical geneticist and run a clinic uh, at our hospital uh, for adults is about half my time. Uh, and so like many of you and many around the world, uh, we're excited about using whole genome uh, sequencing in cohorts like this. Uh, so. Uh, doing whole genome sequence to uh, find uh, genotype-phenotype correlations. Uh, we've been engaged in this, uh, and we've started a clinical service around that. So uh, in, in that arena, uh, this is a large cohort uh, for us. Um, um, and um, the other part of uh, what we're excited about and we're doing as far as uh, looking for variants to guide treatment is uh, I'm involved in a U01 project uh, led by Robert Green, funded by the NHGRI, where we have a uh, two by two design uh, in a small trial uh, and of only 200. Uh, but we're looking at um, physicians and their patients together as the subjects of this uh, study uh, and looking at standard of care versus uh, whole genome sequencing. Uh, and looking at the support needed to actually use that within uh, the clinical care model. So a little bit bigger cohort than our families, but not that much. And this is an advance. Is that the last slide? No. I hope not. <laughs> <laughs>
You shouldn't put all your sequence data on the next slide. It's <laughs> <laughs> all that animation. Call for the next slide, please. Okay. Next slide, please. So, uh, based on some of the uh, discussion last night, um, thinking about um, a uniform database to go to, uh, I think w one of the things around clinical medicine that uh, I've always been impressed by is the amount of uh, knowledge that's carried around uh, by clinicians but never uh, published or reported in any way. And I think that as we, uh, as we get a, uh, a unified database that people can go to, I think creating opportunities for uh, clinicians to annotate uh, changes based on uh, single cases uh, should be something that we should think about um, if we could set up the structures to uh, to align the motivations uh, it could be a, a powerful tool um, and as I said uh, right now there's lots of uh, information that doesn't get out into the uh, into the published world I don't think we'll uh, we should stand for that as we get into the uh, genome error So, um, in thinking about uh, this, uh, this use of uh, genome variants to uh, drive treatment, um, I, like, uh, like all of you, are excited about kind of the, uh, the bottom row there, um, where we're getting to ultimately, but I'm a little worried about this uh, decade, uh, and I think there's some threats to our um, our use of genomic medicine, which I wanted to just uh, talk about a little bit. So uh, one of the things uh, I'm concerned about is that we're, we're not really in control of the pace at which genomic medicine will be incorporated into clinical medicine. Uh, and I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, um, you've seen the slide uh, last night, um, and uh, in many ways. Um, the other way to represent this uh, that I use is to think about uh, the cost of uh, DNA sequencing like this in 1985 uh, in or around when the uh, Human Genome Project was uh, proposed. It would cost you about $10 to get uh, one uh, nucleotide sequence. 1991, a uh, dollar per base, uh, 2001, 2,000 bases. Um, and uh, as of last year, um, I guess this is debatable by people who know more than me about this field, but uh, about a hundred million. So uh, for the cost of what many of us spend uh, at Starbucks buying our coffee, uh, you can get an enormous amount of data. So um, this, as you know, has gotten the attention not only of uh, scientists and clinicians, but also of companies uh, that are interested in um, providing DNA sequence, uh, sometimes directly to consumers. Um, and this was mentioned last night too, this, uh, this idea that uh, people will, uh, will go directly uh, to companies outside of healthcare and get their genome data. But they, um, they will bring it back to healthcare and um, you know, I think the enthusiasm for this will be, rightly be driven by uh, important stories that are being told of uh, the use of genomes to, uh, to help people. This is a story about uh, the uh, Milwaukee case that you're all probably familiar with. And as, um, as genomes get introduced into medicine outside of our control and probably faster than uh, many of us might choose, uh, I think there's some threats to genomic medicine. Uh, I think the biggest is economic, uh, but then there's possibly some political ones too. So um, the Affordable uh, Care Act was uh, discussed last night. I think we've all seen projections like this. Uh, I don't think any of these projections uh, take into account the cost that will be driven off of uh, genomes uh, as we start to uh, 
use them widely in clinical medicine. And I think uh, in the next decade, we could see a real ballooning of costs uh, around uh, genomics. And uh, my worry is that it will uh, draw, draw the wrong attention and people will start to uh, wonder uh, what we're, we're getting for uh, <coughs> genomic medicine when there's costs without clear benefits. Um, fear is that we'll be acting on false positives. So, um, so now as people are ready to launch uh, pre-natal uh, screening of parents for uh, autosomal recessive disease, I think it's uh, instructive to remember that um, one of the, the best examples of how that can be done started out with a, uh, a false positive on the list of uh, variants that were screened. The I-148T uh, was uh, later removed from the uh, standard screen. Um, but people that may have made reproductive choices off that or may in the future make it uh, could draw bad uh, press and bad attention to our efforts here. Um, many people have cited uh, the uh, potential problems associated with uh, false positives around BRCA. Uh, there undoubtedly will be others. Um, Sorry that's so small, but uh, we can all rest assured that it will uh, eventually come to this. This is a man being carted away by the police saying that his genome made him do it uh, with a dead, dead man in the background. Um, so, so concerns about uh, drawing the wrong attention have, have made me wonder at, by the end of this decade when I think some of that uh, attention could be focused on us. Uh, what will we have to show as far as improving the effectiveness of uh, health care? So Eric told us that we should focus back here. <laughs> so in thinking about that um, and thinking about cohorts, um, I was going through a thought experiment of uh, what the priority should be in choosing targets uh, for which genomic medicine can and should guide treatment. I think um, one of the, uh, rec or some of the recommendations would be that uh, we might uh, choose to focus on things that we're really bad at in uh, clinical care as priorities, uh, things that are driving or will drive significant health care spending, uh, things where there, a moderate impact could lead to significant improvements in health, uh, priorities uh, and targets chosen which affect a lot of people, and obviously uh, they should be things with a strong genomic basis. So um, in thinking about this, I thought of smoking cessation, which meets uh, many of those uh, priorities, uh, but not all. Um, and I guess I would wonder if we shouldn't be thinking about a, a grand vision of how to use cohorts to do uh, a, <laughs> a genome project for this decade. Um, and so if we fill in the blanks, I'm sure people will come up with all different uh, fill-ins here, but uh, if we were to promise at this point that cohorts or one large cohort uh, would set out to understand the genomic basis of a specific problem and that we would anticipate uh, that um, this genomic uh, understanding would contribute to the development of significant therapies to control that problem by the end of this decade. I think if we had a strategy that looked something like that, it would help us to meet uh, whatever criticisms might be in the, uh, in the near future of genomics. And so I would propose that uh, one thing we think about is, uh, is this problem. So this is the CDC's uh, obesity trends in uh, U.S. adults uh, over the last two decades. And uh, you can see here from uh, 1990, when no state had more than 15% uh, of the adults uh, obese uh, to 2000 and then to 2010. Um, by 2020, uh, this map will only get, uh, um, I guess, a deeper uh, brown or uh, burnt orange there, I imagine. So uh, this problem cuts across all age groups, all ethnic groups. Uh, I think it probably cuts across all institutions of the NIH, obesity is associated with uh, cancer, uh, diabetes, uh, renal failure, arthritis, uh, changes in longevity. Um, 
and obviously it's a worldwide problem, uh, not just a problem here, though we, uh, we are world leaders in it. Uh, and so uh, as far as a grand vision for a large cohort or uh, several cohorts, um, I would propose that we, uh, we think about obesity or other problems in, um, in this way. And with that, I'll, I'll end. Thank you, Mike. Any questions? Let's open the discussion. Please. With, with respect to the, 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 the question of, of not trying to identify causes of disease, but the question of, on, on this topic of how to identify um, differences in the effects of treatment, um, I'd be interested in people's views on um, whether the emphasis should be on the efficacy or, um, and I think Eric was getting at this point earlier, uh, on the safety of treatments. Because um, uh, I think there's, in the past, been a huge emphasis on <coughs> taking treatments that are known to work and then looking to see whether we can find out whether they work more or less in other people, which I think is, um, my, my view is, largely futile. Um, I think if they work, then they largely work in most people. I think all of, a, a lot of the time, the huge efforts into trying to find out whether they work differently is, is not the focus. Whereas I think there would be much more mileage to be gained in looking for those people who get side effects and where I think it's quite reasonable to anticipate that there will be genetic determinants that have big effects. We've had a number of false claims for differences in efficacy. If I take statins, KIF-6, is a really good example of false claims of differences in efficacy, whereas SLC1B1 is a very clear s s genetic determinant of, of safety of statins, and then turns out to be relevant to the safety of other drugs, such as methotrexate. So I, I, I wonder whether there should be greater emphasis on safety in the next 10 years, and less uh, emphasis on efficacy. Um, in, in the direction we go on, the use of treatment. So as a, as a note, note of caution, right, there are many studies that looked at efficacy, uh, and there are still, as of today, there are no clinical, to my knowledge, there are no clinical recommendations. So the, for some reason, you know, I presume it's the complexity of the phenotype, this has not made it into clinical practice. So while I think I completely agree with you, Rory, it is... Uh, it seems to be a natural, a low-hanging fruit almost, but it has not um, panned out so far. No, actually, I was, I was arguing that, that efficacy, I wouldn't put emphasis on. I think that, oh, that I think I'd put the emphasis on safety. Safety, but you know, I, my, my comments actually are for both. You know, right. Neither efficacy, at least not in brain disorders, that's the area I can sp yeah. speak for. It, it may not have got into the clinical armamentarium, but I think if you actually look at the evidence, there's really good evidence for genetic determinants of safety of, of drugs. Um, and, and it's actually been relatively poorly studied. Uh, and yet there are good examples, whereas there are, far, I think, far fewer good examples on efficacy. So, so this is, <coughs> yeah, pharmacogenomics is something I, I think I know something about, but I, and I, and I say I think. The, I agree with Rory. The, the, the Determinants of efficacy obviously vary by drug and by drug class, but tend to be pretty mushy. Uh, they tend to be driven by uh, co-administration co of other drugs. They tend to be driven by the disease substrate you're treating. And the likelihood that they're going to be single genetic variants with large effect sizes is small. The flip side is that there are these exotic and sometimes not so rare um, adverse drug effects that, that really do sort of seem to come out of the blue in an unpredictable way, and that, that for me means that there may be a big genetic basis. And, and Rory's group has been a, a leader in defining the, the genetic basis of myopathy during statin therapy, and there is a big effect of a single SNP. Um, and, uh, and some people have actually moved that toward implementation. And there are many, many examples of adverse drug effects of the same kind, the same kind of ilk, uh, uh, the things that I think of are the Stevens-Johnson syndrome and the hepatotoxicity with certain drugs that are that are well predicted by by HLA-B variants. So, so I think that an early focus on on unusual and unanticipated drug effects uh, is there's mileage in that. 
that said, there are examples of variable efficacy. Clopidogrel comes to mind. And maybe you can sort of say, well, the reason you have variable efficacy is because what you're really looking at is a predictor of, of failure of efficacy in some people, which is predicted by a pharmacogenetic variant that, that influences its pharmacokinetics. So I think that, that uh, you have to do it sort of drug by drug and, and take one step back and think to yourself, is there likelihood that this, that variability in response to this drug is going to be driven by a small number of variants with large effect sizes or a large, large number of variants, some of which has to do with the disease, some of which have to do with the way the drug is handled. And, uh, but I, I do think that if there's low-hanging fruit in this space, it, it's in the pharmacogenetic space. I mean, I, 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 can, can, my question was, PCSK9. What do you what do you do once you know somebody has a PCSK9 variant? What's the clinical action? Or, or even fibrillin. I mean, I, you know, so so somebody has a has Marfan syndrome and they have a fibrillin mutation or a, or a TGF beta receptor mutation. What? How does that change therapy? Go, you're, you're, you're as qualified as me to answer. Or, you know, hypertrophic. It, it does. <laughs> okay. So, so in Marfan's or TGF beta mutations, we would screen for aortic root diameter and prevent uh, aortic. Oh, I, I, no, no, I, that's not my question. My question is, it's somebody who, who you know has Marfan syndrome. How does knowing the genotype inform the therapy, not not making the diagnosis? Well, I, I think we're more focused on the people who you don't know have Marfan syndrome. Oh, okay. I can I can I can I can buy if that. If you know they have Marfan syndrome, we don't right. genotype them usually. And do you think the diagnosis is made by a genetic test, or by or, or by a clinical phenotype? Uh, there, there's certainly a, a percentage of Marfan patients and Lowy's Dietz patients and other patients in this category that uh, the diagnosis is unclear until there's genotype information. Yeah, we make this unsuspected diagnosis in adulthood frequently. Yeah, so, so you know, when I'm not doing pharmacogenomics, I'm a cardiac arrhythmia guy, so I live this life all the time, and I'm, I'm ambivalent about the role of genotyping in identifying patients who have variants that may or may not affect arrhythmia susceptibility and maybe Marfan and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and those things are different. But it, it seems to me we run a great risk of telling people you have, a, you have a, a variant of unknown significance that might make you drop dead. Have fun. Um, because there, there's not much you can do right now beyond agonize. And I think it's something that the whole field needs to deal with. But so, I'm being so parochial. I, I, I agree with the uh, basic concern and a fundamental tension in, in the thinking about uh, the applications of kind of data we're talking about collecting really ha has to do with this personalization of care, which has received an enormous amount of hype and, uh, and guiding the development of really new therapies. And I, I think both of the examples that you cite are uh, actually quite exciting in terms of their potential for guiding development of new therapies, especially drug development. And, uh, and I, I'm not a clinician, but have been uh, unimpressed with their potential in this sort of personalized medicine space. And uh, I, I actually would advocate a, uh, a fairly major shift, at least in rhetoric, in, in the direction of you know, what we're trying to do is improve the development of really New therapies. To, to this end, just coming back to some of the comments this morning, you know, uh, the, these are very, very important individual questions, but we're at that paradox of getting, trying to figure this out from very large sample sets unless we knew already who we wanted to sequence for a very particular outcome, per se, you know, designing a study to sequence those individuals who have a particular severe hypersensitivity to a drug or, or, or what, what, you know, what, what have you. But the issue, I guess, is when we fit, let's turn this around, when we have these very large cohorts and we have large scale sequencing, which I think is on the table here, is, is this something that we, we can have as a secondary or should this be a primary point of choice for what samples and, and what would be prioritized in terms of some portion of the space of sequencing be, you know, individuals who are selected 
particularly on some clinical outcomes that have been identified. You know, I mean, there, there, there are very different ways to choose samples from many of these cohorts and clinical series and the like, and I think um, we, we should explore that a little bit more about sort of what kind of prioritization would it be the life-threatening Stevens-Johnson syndrome or, you know, the drop-dead cardiac complex, you know, you know, response to a particular anti-inflammatory agent or whatever? I just have a comment. That was, that was a really nice presentation, Mike, um, and really gives us the clini clinician uh, medical geneticist perspective. Um, one thing that's a little bit missing from the overall discussion, it, there seems to be a lot of emphasis on drug treatments and not on preventive or prevention treatments because, I mean, the way I think about genetics is it's an exposure over a lifetime that leads to risk over a lifetime. Maybe it's a risk of single events like a cardiac arrhythmia. Maybe it's, maybe it's a long-term risk like atherosclerosis developing over the lifespan. And both for the treatments and maybe even behavioral modifications, it would seem to me that we're thinking about the preventive space, not not the the treatment of the disease at its end uh, at the end of its course. So I I guess I would just advocate for having prevention somewhere in the general statement of what is being thought of for these cohorts that are being sequenced. I would agree with that, but to the treatments, wouldn't wouldn't an interesting um, at least in a, an extra thing to get is even if you're in a large cohort and the focus might be on etiology and so for Marfans you would discover something like this but wouldn't it also be interesting for those conditions where therapy is so variable where half of the people do fabulously well and half of the people do terribly I'm not saying this would be the sole basis for choosing but that would certainly be a point in favor of additional information from your cohort on how people with that disease subsequently did. That would suggest there is a findable thing which may distinguish those that do well, radiation or, or chemo actually, from those that don't. So in, I'm not sure it would drive the selection, but a cohort would be more attractive to me to sequence if, if it had the capacity to add on subsequent success four therapies that were very variably affected, and therefore I was suspicious maybe if I only knew more genetics, I would know why half of the people did well and half did poorly. Would, that would be a largely a therapeutic question, but embedded in a, in a cohort chosen where the focus would be on incidence. <laughs> but you'd get more points if you could tell me something about therapy. Eric. I guess Mike and Gail maybe is one of the things you get when sequencing large cohort is a, is a complete or fairly unbiased representation of the phenotype given the genotype. Or if you go to OMIM, you see sort of genotype given phenotype. And I'm wondering if you think in medicine we'll actually start to diagnose and treat disease based on genotype and give up, not give up, but downweight the role of phenotype. because. What we see is when we start to sequence large numbers of individuals that according to OMIM, you know, they should have four ears and two heads, and they, they seem to be perfectly fine. So I think that um, cystic fibrosis is like the classic example of this, right? So cystic fibrosis was this horrible disease that kills, killed you in childhood, and I remember arguing with a pulmonologist, you know, 20 years ago that I thought there were adults who had mild forms of cystic fibrosis because they got pseudomonas infections. And I, you know, this was a cystic fibrosis pediatrician pulmonologist who said, like, no, that's not cystic fibrosis. And, and he, maybe he's right, it's not cystic fibrosis, but it's the same gene, it's just a different mutation. And so we need to learn about that variability, and I think we understand in clinical genetics that what we see is often the tip of the iceberg, and the phenotype spectrum <coughs> is often much, much broader and may include, you know, just infertility and no lung disease. Um, but that said, there is specific cystic fibrosis treatment for one mutation, not the common mutation, but only for people with a specific, not ridiculously rare, but not the common mutation for cystic fibrosis, so that the actual treatment, what is broken in the gene, affects your therapy, not just that that gene's broken, but what part of that gene is broken. And so I think there's a lot, a lot that we're going to learn in that spectrum of what represents the disease. 
but we have to be very careful when we see a mutation in a gene to say, oh, we know what a mutation in this gene does, because we know what one mutation in that gene does doesn't mean we know what a different mutation in that gene does. The last comment before we move on. In a, in a DNA first world, uh, we'll be doing, we'll be using that as a signal to go back and re-phenotype people, but in somebody with zero recognized prior probability that gets a variant, uh, we have to be careful not to, uh, not to make the diagnosis based solely on that. One more comment. Uh, I think Gail makes a really important point that uh, for, for many of these known severe disease mutations, we don't actually know the, the full impact of, the, of these variants. And one very powerful thing we could do with large cohorts would be to go back and genotype all of the variants that are present in these databases of severe disease mutations and look for phenotypes. For instance, in individuals who are homozygous for alleged recessive disease mutations who appear to be, who appear to be healthy, indicating either errors in the database or variable penetrance. Uh, also looking for phenotypes for carriers of recessive disease mutations. Um, it's, I think all of us who work on clinical exome data know that there are, there are a number of these mutations in the databases that are just wrong or, the, or where the penetrance is very poorly estimated and it would be, it would be fantastic to have that data. But one point I think we do need to make though is, is distinguishing between questions that can be addressed with targeted genotyping of large cohorts and questions that require large scale sequencing. I think there might there's a little bit of confusion because we don't necessarily need to sequence everyone in these big cohorts to get these answers. There are many questions that we can address just by going back and, and, and doing much cheaper genotyping of these, of these very large groups. Just before we move on, in terms of the outcomes, I mean, there are cohorts where we can address questions of um, um, efficacy and treatment and prevention, right? If you're just thinking about uh, the large HMO cohorts, mm -hmm. with the, with, with, they all have EMRs.